know what Jonathan means? It means Jehovah is given. And who has the Lord given us? The Holy Spirit. David means beloved. And who is the beloved? We are. Saul means desire. All right. And it was Saul that sought David, sought David to kill him. And we know the one that desired himself, that exalted himself, Satan, was cast down out of his place. And so we need to understand or to catch a revelation of what it means to be in the secret place. Especially when we know the adversary, Satan, is going to and fro seeking to devour us. Psalms 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Again, the secret place here, but it says, He who dwells. The secret place is a place you have to go to. What does it look like? It means reading. It means praying. It means forsaking not the assembly or the gathering together of yourselves. It means ministering hope. It means ministering faith. Because the secret place is a place that we have to posture ourselves in our heart by the Spirit. The last scripture here reads, Psalms chapter 22 verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. To enthrone here is to inhabit, is to sit. So as we begin to talk to God, we know the revelation that has come forth. We know that we built an altar here, that there's an altar in this place where the Lord has come to sit, where the Lord has come to see about his people. And so again, my encouragement to us today is to begin to see this place as the throne of God. Begin to see this place, the meeting place, where the Lord has chosen to sit forever, where the Lord has chosen to place his throne. Come on, let's talk to God.
just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dish is starts to fade Clearing there is hope and there is freedom
you are love and so there is no way we get to encounter you without knowing that we have, we have encountered you because you are love the very mention of your name is love the revealing of your majesty is love 
even though you are you are the judge of all and yet you are the lover of our souls we thank you Lord that as we speak these words that they will bring about a revival on the inside of each and every one of us that we may wake up yet again to the intimacy that was the original design in the heart of the Father that every single one of us saying that for endless days we will sing his praise that we will be like Adam before the fall always anticipating the manifestation of God's presence always looking forward to an engagement with the King of Kings Father Lord we thank you because our lips have sung now Lord may our hearts draw closer to you and for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord Oh Lord our God I want you to say for endless days For endless days We will sing your praise Oh Lord Oh Lord our God We will sing your praise oh Lord we will sing your praise forevermore. Every day that we wake, we will sing your praise. For you are the Lord. Oh Lord, our God. Mama Sunday, Mama Monday, I'm the Sunday. I'm the Sunday. i to your every breath Lord let my heart away to the essence of your love when your heart beats let mine be too Lord that we may awake to the very essence of your, your love every single one of us that we may awake to the very essence of your love that we might be truly in sync with you we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god lord i give you everything I want you to sing that song together with the band that I live for you alone. I live for you alone. Every breath, every breath that I take. And every moment that my eyes are open. Moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me, God. Lord, have your way in me. that in just a moment and I just want you to recognize what is really going on in here father we give you praise 
folks. I mean, just imagine if every one of us was singing like the band was singing, in particular, like Camille was singing. Imagine what would happen in this place if every single one of us decide to register our voices before the Lord. It's going to be completely electric in here. Totally. And I can tell you for a fact that you don't have to wait until you have had all the voice training in the world. You don't even have to wait until you can sound good enough for me to listen to you. Because I don't care. And I'm not the one you're singing to. But just whatever comes out of you is good enough for the Lord. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, if God was picky about voices, he wouldn't have said, let everything that has breath. Even he, God, would have said, uh, just a handful of y'all. But he says, let everything. As long as you have breath, God is okay with your praise. But we get so psychedelic and so overly consumed by the carnal things, by all things of the extremity that we actually miss the opportunity to just make a submission before the Lord. It is because, you know, time and time again, people tell us off. They tell us that we're not doing enough. Right from the time that you're a little child at school, they tell you off. Everybody sets a standard for you. And so we bring all that fear before the Lord and we're so careful how to... But the Bible says that the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom for you to be yourself. Father, we worship you, we give you praise. Let's just thank God for, for the moment that we have just had and celebrate the band here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Alrighty. Praise God. We're going to sit down in a moment, but I want us to first of all read the book of Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 7. We're going to read Nehemiah 1 7 and then we're just going to give a shout and we will be seated. Um, Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. Some people have unceremoniously categorized him amongst the minor prophets. And when you ask what is the criteria for major and minor, they speak about the volume of work that was recorded. But let me tell you something. These guys, and in particular, anybody that prophesies about the Lord Jesus is not minor in my own books. Because once you have a mighty name upon your lips, you become a mighty man upon the earth. Uh, someone didn't hear that. Even though, look, a male and the band, apart from Christian, they were not here at the all-night prayer meeting. They've not been here for weeks wherein we've been talking about the name of the Lord being a strong tower. And they just came out at us today with that song about the name of the Lord. Um, okay, so let's do this. Let's, um, I was looking for Nahum instead of Nehemiah. That's why I couldn't find it. Alrighty. So I'm still trying to come out to read here. Okay, let's go. So what does it say? Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 7. He says, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Now, this is something that was said by prophet Nehemiah long, long time ago. And when the apostle John came on, on board, apostle John, what did he say? We may have to wait for Neve because I don't want anybody to miss this. He said, if we say that we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. The appreciation for the love of God begins with first of all recognizing that none of us can earn his approval. And because he has watched over humanity for thousands of years, different kinds of people, different types of enablement, and God already knew Right from the first generation, he knew. He said, my spirit will not forever strive with man because he is indeed flesh. So this is what God wants each and every one of us to begin with. An acceptance or an admittance of not being able or not having been able to keep every commandment. Everything that God commanded Moses, even right here as we're standing here. I know some of y'all are saying, but we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Okay, let's even say that everything that Jesus commanded you to do. Loving your neighbor as yourself, blessing those who hurt and persecute you. How many of us can say that we have gone to the school of humility and love and graduated with flying colors in that grace of being able to bless those who persecute us? 
A lot of the people who persecute us, we curse them back. That's what we do. And so we can't. And because we know that we cannot, how come we have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? It is all by grace. That is the beginning of the appreciation of the love of God. What I noticed while the worship was on, and not even just noticed, I heard the Lord say that we need to recognize how to position ourselves before the Lord simply because if we do not know how to receive his love, we will not know how to love him in return. And if we are not loving God, we are not experiencing God, period. God is not anything else. He is love. And so you only experience God and the tangibility of his presence to the tune of your love for him. And so while I was in worship, you know, every time some people have come to meet me and they say, well, Pastor Moses, you must sing a lot. I said, why do you say that? Because they say you're always crying in front every time there's worship. I'm like, yeah, so who says I'm crying because I have sinned? Couldn't I be crying because the love of God is so strong? And that, you see what I mean? But that is because people have come to associate their acceptance before God with their good works. And the Bible says even your works of righteousness are like filled with righteousness before God. So why don't we just lay that aside and not even make it part of the requirement. In this presence is about the love. I am there experiencing the intensity of his love. And there was a time I noticed that there, were, there was maybe just one other person on the floor along with me. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Can people not feel what is going on in here? I pray for you today divinely and supernaturally by the grace of God that in this very season, not the next, you will experience the robe of his train. I'm telling you, I know that you thought I said wrong because people talk about the train of his robe. But I am talking about, many of us, we can see the train of his robe. He's a grand, he's a grand display. But what about that robe that is in that train, the robe of his garment? Let me tell you something, the moment you experience it, I can tell that you haven't. Or maybe you're just in rebellion. Maybe you have, but you just choose to be in rebellion. Because the moment you experience that, it's like the Lord passes by and then you get caught in the, in the waving of his robe. And you get catch a fragrance of him. Your life will never remain the same again. Your worship, your adoration of him will never remain the same again. So I am praying and declaring over communion house. That in this season, you will experience that robe. You will feel the breeze that is blowing from his garment. You see, because you can't be... Uh, okay, be seated. Praise God. Because we need to even talk about that for a moment. We need to talk about that for a moment. Okay. Does anybody know why this thing is shaking like a leaf today? Okay. Even my microphone is trembling. No, no, he's trembling in his presence but y'all can still hear me right okay Awesome. Alrighty, I think that sounds a little better. God is good. So let us talk about this for just a moment. Masia, Papa, and family, good to see you. God bless you. Let's talk about this for a moment. Do you know that you and I can be in this room as we are right now and be experiencing the wind in this room differently? I'm going to share with you a lecture that the Holy Spirit gave to me on this subject he was talking to me using some words that they sound like English but when I was repeating them I'm like I'm not even going to try to google them because I already know what it means but then as he was saying it to me I was already thinking of how I'm going to say it to you and so there is an exercise that all of us need to learn how to engage in and that is to practice being able to function multi-dimensionally you know we're talking to you about dimensions as we are in this room there are so many dimensions at play now 
How many people believe that there are angels in here right now? What is the color of the shirt? Kenyatta. Kenyatta, the color of the shirt of the angel that is closest to you right now, what color is it? It's hard to tell because you can't see that dimension as clearly as you can see this one. If I asked you what's the color of my shirt, you can tell that it is black, right? Simply because you are very much connected into this dimension. But does that mean there are no angels here? Does that mean they're not clothed and arraigned beautifully? No. But it's just because that is what you are conversant with. But can I tell you the science behind your inability to perceive that dimension? It's because that dimension is intangible to your dimension. A lot of us are in this place right now. If somebody calls my phone, Ryan's phone is not going to ring simply because the frequency that represents my phone number can only be accessed by my SIM card. So my SIM has the capacity to catch that call when it comes through. But even though you all have the same phones, at least mostly, we know some people still have droids. I know you're here. That's why we prayed especially before the service because of such things as droids that may be in the meeting. But there are people with iPhones the same as mine, but they cannot catch my call simply because my frequency is intangible to them. But they're in the same space. Very close. That's what happens when we come into God's presence and God is dishing out his love and some people are able to respond to it. Some people can experience the tickling of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God can tickle you. How many people have just found themselves being tickled and almost looking around like, is anybody tickling me because you just feel that joy? Has it ever happened to you? Yeah, yeah. So if it doesn't happen to you, don't worry. Just uh, ask one of these people afterwards what they ate for lunch. Maybe you should try that next time. No, but seriously, ask somebody what they did. The first time that I experienced the tickling of the Holy Spirit, what I did was very simple. I made a move in obedience. I made a sacrifice that God, God knew the things that, were, that I was not easy, ready to let go of. Amongst my friends in my second year at the university, I was the life of the party. I was, they would call me, they would call me MTN. MTN is one of the largest providers of internet serv of, of telephone service all across Africa. And then what that meant was Moses, the network. Because they were like, I literally would connect everybody. So I would go into a place and people wouldn't be talking to one another. And as soon as I get them, I'm like, have you met Manuel Lida? Come on, come and talk to her. And then I go to the next person. And I would enjoy that every single day of the school year. After lectures, that's what I was doing. I was connecting people. I would miss classes so that I can be fresh for my evening life. Oh yes, if you're still in school, make sure you hear the Holy Spirit clearly before you try that. But guess what? The Lord called me out of that place. I would be in the middle of just hanging out with people and having so much fun. And after a while, I started to feel like someone is waiting for me at home. And I would run home and after a couple of times of doing that, I thought to myself, okay, there must be a reason why I feel like someone is waiting for me. What if truly someone is waiting for me? And then immediately he responded with tickles. I laughed until it almost started to hurt. And I was like, you can do that? Let me tell you something. When God made man in his image and in his likeness, God demonstrated very clearly, even without too many words, it demonstrated why he made man he would come to man in the cool of the evening just to fellowship with him that was how the beginning started and what did we see at the end in revelation chapter 3 verse 20 jesus is like i'm still god this is what i've always done this is why i made you i still just want fellowship he says i am at the door and i am knocking if you would open the door i want to come and sup with you he wants to come and eat with you but think about it this way. If an invisible God is waiting at the door and he wants to come and eat with you, 
then that means there must be a middle ground or there must be a way both of you can sit at the same table and be able to hold hands and grab the same bread. But from your perspective, while you're still in the flesh, his existence is very intangible to you. That's why they call him the invisible God. But that moment of obedience allowed for me to be translated from one dimension, which is the dimension of the mundane, into a spiritual dimension wherein I could actually feel his touch. And I'm encouraging you because God is not looking to make you famous. The Bible says that you should seek to live your life peaceably. God is not seeking to make you rich necessarily. The Bible says the cattle upon the thousand hills, they belong to God. And by the way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Have you noticed that people who really have money don't try to show you that they have money? A lot of the billionaires that we have in this world, they wear New Balance. They don't even wear Jordans. A lot of the wealthy people you see in the world today, they wear Apple watches. They don't even wear Rolexes. Because it is the people who do not have as much who are trying to make you not look down on them, you know, by spending money that they do not have to impress people that they do not like, as they say. And so God is in that position too, wherein it's like everything is mine and everything that I have is yours. So why are you so fixated on having just $500,000 in your account when we own everything? That doesn't even make sense to God. Why we clamor for these things. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when I teach around intimacy with the Lord, I find most people already thinking of how much their lives would change if they would have such an encounter with God. I feel the touch of the Holy Spirit. It tickles me in my room. Oh, I'm going to be on CNN. You see what I mean? I've had people challenge my position about my intimacy with God. To say, oh man, if truly you have had such encounters with God, shouldn't you be a bestseller on Amazon selling books? And I'm like, well, from your perspective, that is what an encounter with God should translate into. But from my perspective, an encounter with God itself is enough. It doesn't have to become anything else. When Jesus came, the word of God became flesh. That was supposed to be enough. But some people were not okay with it. They wanted him to turn and become something else. They wanted him to become a general in, in the army to defeat Ro the Romans. See, the thing is, we do not recognize that God is the beginning and the end. So the moment you have him, there is no need to try to, to trade what you have for things that are perishing. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. But what have we done in this generation? We have gone to borrow the truth and we're selling it for money. But at the end of the day, things are changing because we are moving into that dispensation that was promised to us by God through the mouth of prophet Ezekiel that a time is coming that we will not need another to teach us because the Lord himself will be our teacher. That is what it means to be awake. Because you just know in your heart what the Lord is doing in the land. And so I stand here today mostly as a witness to know exactly what is going on in the world. The Lord once again is inviting us into intimacy with him but there is no intimacy without contact let me say that again for all of y'all who are dreaming of long distance relationships that thing is a lie of the devil is a trap of the enemy but people are bought into it simply because you know they can keep seeing each other on social media and you know they, they smile at each other but there is no substitute for touch when you are friends with somebody, you make contact. Not my words, but all of our experiences. It's just better when you can see people face to face, when you can touch them, when you can be at least six feet away from them. You know, as human beings, we now know that when we are at least six feet away from each other, certain things get activated in our hearts. I'm not just talking about your emotions. Your physical heart starts to emit signals in the direction of the other person. And what does the Bible say? 
the Bible says that we need to come together and greet one another with a holy kiss. The word kiss there just means contact. When, when we see each other, we shouldn't just be waving at each other from a distance. We need to make contact. It's very critical. It's very important. And so if contact is the crux of communion, then guess what? We should seek to find a way to make contact with God. Now, so how many people can remember the four things that I've so, said so far? Thing number one is that God is love. And so if you do not experience his love, then you're not experiencing God. A lot of us come into the presence of God. And do you know what? Miss Barneda, we experience what others have said about God. We keep replaying it even though we are in his presence wherein we can engage him and encounter him for ourselves. Sometimes we make do with our imagination of what we think the presence of God should be like. But I am telling you today because the Bible says that God is love. If you do not experience love in his presence, then everything else that you're experiencing could either be a figment of your imagination, could actually be an illusion that was sold to you by another. It can be all of the shones, but it is not the love of God so I'm encouraging you today because my heart was moved with compassion for everybody that is in here because I knew it that certain people here were not experiencing that love of God as I was in his presence this is the reason why we do what we do if I would leave everything behind to come here then I must get the most of what is here you understand what I mean? Now, if you leave the world behind to be in a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus, then you must get all of what he has to offer. Nobody wants to be married and have a spouse and then the spouse, as soon as they join them on their wedding day, they go home in separate cars and they go to different homes and they live in different sites. Nobody wants that kind of spouse. I mean, some people wish they had the, that kind of spouse because the one in their house is a pain in the butt. But that's because the love of God is not reigning as it should. But in reality, it should be by proximity and it should be in intimacy. So we need to experience God that way. So one of the other things that I said is what? That to encounter an invisible God, you need to understand how to make contact across your dimensions. You are in a physical dimension, but God is not always in the physical dimension. The Bible says God is spirit. And those who must worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There was a time that he came to meet us where we're at when the word of God became flesh. But when that word of God became flesh, what did he tell them? He said a time is coming wherein you would not be restricted by these physical constraints of having to go to one place or another. He says a time is coming wherein it's gonna be spiritual. You are not being given an invitation to transcend so we know that it is possible for us to leave our dimension where we're in and then engage God in the dimension that he's in let me give you an illustration you see in the room that we're in I'll give you one that I believe is very straightforward in the room that we're in right now there are two things that describe every single body every single body every single form that is in here we use those two words interchangeably, but they mean two different things. The one word is situation. You ask people, where is that thing situated? Where is it located? Right? Where a thing is situated is not the same as where it is positioned. But if you've ever ordered furniture that is too big for you to carry, you find people in the same room using those two words to describe the same thing, whereas it's not so. So people would come and say, so where would you like this piece of, uh, with this dresser? Is that the one I call chest? Yeah, where would you like this dresser to be situated? And then the response would be like, oh, can you position it over there? Have, have you ever experienced those two words being used interchangeably? Where do you want it situated? The other person says, where, where, where do you, how do you want it to be positioned? There are two different words, and I'll tell you how they can be different. John right now is situated on the third row, first seat. That is where he is situated, but his position refers not to his location, but to his posture. The word position and posture are from the same origin. So what is his posture? John's posture is a sitting posture, right? 
And so when he's sitting down in that position, he experiences the air in this room differently. And I'll tell you how. You see, cold air is very dense. So when you're in a room like this, the colder air or the cooler air is lower to the ground. And then the hot air rises. That is how we have hot air balloons, right? Because once air is hot, it becomes lighter and whatever is lighter rises higher, okay? And that was the reason why nobody could go up until Jesus came up because our sins are heavy. And when Jesus came and he forgave us of our sins, we became light enough to rise to where the Father is. You understand what I mean? No matter how much joy God has for you in his kingdom, if you are weighed down by the cares of this world and all the worries, guess what happens? You are too heavy to experience light bodiness. And the lightest possible body that you can experience or the lightest body experience that you can have is when you're actually outside of a body and your spirit is free. Because what is spirit? Spirit is air. The word spirit means wind, right? Like I told you, it's very simple. It's not as complicated as we have thought about it to be. When you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about the Holy Wind. And like I told you on Saturday, that the reason why the the, the Holy Spirit is described as the carrier of the kingdom of God is because righteousness, peace, and joy, they are the three gases that make up the air in heaven. On earth, we have like seven major gases, right? We have, we have a little bit of hydrogen, uh, a whole lot of, of neon, we have oxygen, we, we have various gases. We have noble gases, which are a mix of another four gases or so. We have a bunch of things. But in heaven, the Bible says that it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Wind. So when you're in God's presence, what you're breathing in is righteousness, peace, and joy. And the Bible says there is a lot of those things in His presence. There is fullness of joy. Do you understand what I mean? And so when you think about air as being spirit, then that means if your position is a sitting position, you are mostly in the realm of the heavier spirits. And heavier spirits are colder spirits. So John is sitting there, but what he's experiencing is the cool air that is the heavier one, but for him to experience the air that is warmer, he needs to get up and reach for it. Are you still with me? I know this is Georgia. It's very cold. It's very hot outside. So you would rather be sitting down and enjoying the cooler air than stand up for the heat. But I'm using that illustration just for the purposes of letting you know that you can be in the same place and experience different dimensions. So John is sitting down, experiencing cold air. I am standing up. I'm experiencing warmer air. It is still what? Air. But the part of it that I access is different from the part of it that he accesses. So this is how it happens in the realm of the spirit. Your position where God has situated you determines what becomes tangible to you. Cold air is what is tangible to you right now. You can feel it. But hot air, hot, hot air is what becomes tangible to you the moment you grab that pole. You don't even want to be there. It could be 100 degrees right there, close to that roof right now. Whereas it's 70 degrees where you're sitting. So the secret to understanding how to access different dimensions rests in your ability to know how to make a substance out of that which is unseen. I can create a substance out of that which is unseen. Do you know that there is water in this air? But you can't see it. But if I get a condenser, I can get a condenser that sells for a dollar at the dollar store. I can get a condenser, just a tube, right? And just allow air to pass through it. And guess what happens? This same air that you cannot see and the water that is in it that you cannot see suddenly distills and then it becomes water. And you're like, ah, there it is, water. But what have you done? You have been able to make substance out of that which you cannot see. 
But that which you cannot see the entire time was there. That hot air was up there, but until you get a condenser to bring it down, it doesn't come down. So you cannot totally sit until you have obtained. Let me now explain those three things. I said three things just now. I was very conscious of it, but I'm going to tell you what those three things are. Your posture that you take when it comes to your relationship with God determines if other dimensions in God will become accessible to you. So when you take the posture of complacency, wherein worship is going on and you just want to sit down, wherein when it comes to the things of God, you're just so comfortable where you're at. The two scriptures that you can quote is enough for you. That one time that you fasted in the spring of 87 is enough for you. You understand what I mean? Now what are you doing? You are not standing up to chase after him. So your complacency allows for you to be sitting in the midst of things that have already gone cold. Your testimonies are cold. Your revelations are cold. Your experience of God is cold. But the same you, no, nothing is stopping you from standing up and climbing that chair to access something that is fresh, something that is still burning from the coals of the altar. You need to change your posture from that of complacency to that of hunger and thirst. When I'm in God's presence and worship is going on, I do not allow the the I do not allow the the style of music, the the organization of the songs, the accuracy of the drums. I do not allow those things to determine how much I get from that presence because I know that even if we have 10 Davids here, playing all of the instruments and singing, they still cannot by their own ability distill all of what God has. That is left to me because it is to the extent of my faith. You know what faith is? The Bible says faith is the substance of the things that we hope for, the evidence of that which we do not see. So all of that cloud of glory contains the fullness of joy. But I need to have faith. And what is faith? Faith is not just sitting there saying that I believe. Faith is when that belief is in action and actively pursuing that which you think you cannot live without. Because as long as you think you can live without a thing, then it's not yours. <laughs> Let me explain to you how that works. You see, the Bible says, God speaking, the Bible says concerning God, that whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And what is he? He is life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you think that you have life outside of him, you will never chase him enough. When I'm studying my Bible, I'm studying my Bible as though my life depends on it. I read the Bible like as if there is something that is still hidden there that I have not found. And until I find that, I cannot finish building this house. Until I find that, my eyes are not calibrated enough to see all of what God has for me. Because somewhere in this Bible is life. Because the Bible says every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I cannot pick and choose. I tried it before. Many of you know my story. When I was studying the word of God about 20 plus years ago and I would skip genealogies because I thought that they were boring. And Abraham begat Seth and Seth became Lamech and Lamech begat Methuselah and Methuselah begat they can, they, can be, they can be begotting one another. When I read it yesterday, they were begotting one another. If I read it tomorrow, they will still be begotting one another too. And you can't even pronounce those names. No one of us has the authority on those names. Some people have tried to claim authority on the name, uh, what's the name? Nebuchadnezzar. It's Nebuchadnezzar. We can call it whatever we want. It's an inside joke. Only the people who were here like three months ago know what I'm talking about. Yeah, because I was saying the name Nebuchadnezzar, but I was saying it the way that it makes sense to me, which is Nebuchadnezzar, because I know that it's two different names or two different words. And somebody thought I was stuck and was saying Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm like, no. No, 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 no. You watch too much news. That's why. No, no, no hard feelings, sis, in case you're watching. But the morale of the story is this, folks. If I would have continued skipping genealogies, if I, I did for a season, and one day I was studying the Word of God and the Holy Spirit knocked me out, I was in a trance. 
And then I came to this building. It looked like a red brick building. I saw the building like the foundation was laid. The bricks were on one side. And my mission, there was somebody like a master in the dream who kept telling me to get bricks. And I'm like, I got this. So I would get the bricks, but the bricks that had the names that I could not pronounce, I left them. I only took the bricks that didn't have any complications. I took them and I was taking it to the site where the house was being built. I wasn't the one building it. My mission was just to take the bricks. And so after a while, the one that was building it was done and it was like, how do you like it? I'm like, well, to be honest, there's a missing, this wall has holes in it. This one is incomplete. It looks like it had no form. And he said to me, he said, exactly. He says, I am the builder. He says, you are my co-laborer. You are supposed to bring the brick, but you left some behind. He said, every brick that you left is now missing from the structure. And he said to me, every time you skip a name in those genealogies, you are leaving a brick behind. When I came out of that trance, oh, I became an expert in genealogies. In fact, I will read it again and almost kind of like ask the Holy Spirit. I never did, but my attitude was almost like, are you happy now? Because I can read it again. For me to read it again, it doesn't bother me. You understand what I mean? Because I had to come to that particular point wherein I know that every word is important. Because in reality, my life depends on it. And so until we recognize that everything that has to do with my relationship with God should be priority because my life depends on it. So the same way I started the word of God is the same way that I worship because my life depends on what I can get out of his presence. And that is the attitude that we need to have because there is no other way. God's methodology for raising his children is pretty much like the way we train dogs. You want a dog to do something, you give him a treat every time he does it. And then he's going to keep doing it. And God is saying, yes, if you do not hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will not be filled. But when your hunger and thirst will fill you, will satisfy you with every good thing, but then as part of the satisfaction, we're putting more hunger and thirst in there. Just to keep you coming, because if you don't keep coming to the source of life, after a while, you'll be dead. And that is the reason why your testimonies, as great as they might be today, you will need help tomorrow. You see, some of us think that if God can just take me through this season, that's it. No, I, because you know, we go through certain difficulties that we think that huh, if I can just go through this one, God, just this one, just take me through this one. And God is looking at you thinking, why are you in a hurry to go through this little one? Because I have bigger challenges for you next tomorrow. I mean, the moment you come out of this one, I can let you breathe for like a couple of days or weeks. And then before you get comfortable, before you sit down again and be in the cold air, I'm going to do what? I'm going to raise your next blessing so high that even getting on the chair will not allow for you to reach it. You would have to find a ladder. You would have to go back and then run so that you can jump. Because what God wants is he wants you to come up higher. The secret to being able to access dimensions that are beyond our own is by faith. And when you have faith, that means you are hungry. Because if all you have is faith, then that means you don't have it yet. Because faith is not what you want, it's the substance of what you're hoping for. And it's the evidence that one day you will have it. So you can't just say, oh, I have faith, I'm good. <laughs> you can't eat faith. I know some of y'all have tried taking faith to the bank. You know all kinds of sounds an ATM can make when you do that. All kinds of annoying sounds. But that faith can drive you to where you can get what you want. I want to encourage you, begin to re-examine the attitude that you have to the things of God. Let us not let moments pass us by. When we come in here, I'm not crying because I feel like I've let God down. I'm not crying because I feel like I'm not doing enough. enough. I am crying because I know that he will never let me down. 
I am crying because I know that he is more than enough. I am crying because I feel the tangibility of his love. And the moment his love becomes tangible to me, then that means I am in the dimension of that love. And I can give that love a kiss. I can make contact with the, with the, with the love of God. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that until you have kissed the son, it is not well with you. The Bible says, kiss the son and it will be well with you. So if I haven't made contact with the son, I'm still just watching online the goodness of God. But let me tell you something. How many people have watched cooking shows on TV and by so doing, got failed? No. I don't want to watch cooking shows on TV. I want to be invited to the studio to come and sample because that's when I am in the same dimension as the food. When you're watching cooking shows online, you're not in the same dimension. They're in the spiritual dimension from where you're at because they're in electricity. And electricity is the entrance to the realm of the spirit. When you go through electricity, then you go into light. And then when you're in light, then you are in the realm of the spirit. Let me teach you one secret. It's going to help the way that you process the things of God. You see, we don't know anything that can travel faster than light. And the Bible says that God is light. And that's why you can't see him. <laughs> you see, if I move my hand from here quickly, you see it when it was here. And you see it when it is here. The reason why you don't see it while it's moving because it's faster than you are processing. But then if your processing just becomes faster, then you will see my hand every step of the way. That's what we're doing. That's what we do. Every, every, I mean, almost everybody's done that here before when you're watching cat videos online. And something happens too quickly and you slow it down and you're like, <laughs> you see, many of us need to learn how to slow down spiritual experiences like that so we can say, God, there you are. Because he's light. And light is so fast. In fact, I remember a man, I believe it was Robert Leardon who said this thing. He said, if anything can travel at the speed of light, it becomes present in the realm of the spirit. So if your thoughts begin to oscillate that fast, if your desire for God and how much you hunger and thirst and chase after him, David says, as the deer runs to water, so my soul runs after you. If you attain such speed when it comes to your walk with God, guess what? You will be present in the realm of the spirit. You'll be shaking hands with angels because that is the speed that they operate on. And I can prove that to you. Let me tell you something. I remember there was a time that I would pray in tongues for hours before I experienced the tangible presence of God in my room. And after a while, it, starts, it, 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 it started getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter to the point wherein I can go into my room and start groaning in the spirit as a first utterance without even a build up. You see what I mean? But then everybody starts like an old aeroplane that needs a long runway. But then after a while, you become like a drone in his presence. You can just take off in the moment. God expects nothing less than that from his children. He wants us to be with him. The moment he needs us. The moment, you know, because then you, you maximize the time that you spend with him. But the way to do that is by practice. Nobody just gets up one day and knows how to do it. The Bible says we have our senses sharpened by reason of use. You, you, you are able to talk because you practice talking. You are able to walk because you practice walking. And so your spiritual senses with which you can access the corridors of heaven, with which you can relate with spirit beings and with the forces that govern life, is very much also dependent on how much you practice being in the spirit. I want to encourage you, practice being in God's presence so much so that when you come into a gathering like this, right from the first song, <laughs> and I'm not talking about acting it. I mean, there's nothing cool about weeping in front of my eight-year-old girl. Because I am daddy, you know, and I'm supposed to be macho. So that she can think of every boy at school as not being a match for her daddy. You know, lately I noticed, I told my wife, I said, I think something is going on in area. There's a transformation. I said, because now when she comes back from school for like a whole week, all, almost all through last week when she comes back she'll be like dad let me see your arm and I will bring out my pretend guns and I'll be you know when she looks at me I smile but when she looks away <clears throat> and I'm on my teeth because I want her and then, and then 
one day, I think it was Friday, she called Joshua. She was like, Joshua, she said, Josh, this is the real thing, not what you got. <laughs> and Joshua had no words. I was like, don't worry, Joshua, you get there. You know, Rome wasn't built in the day. You have to keep working on it. You have to exercise. You have to, you know. Because the thing is, she wants to see strength. So if you see me crying while she's here, it's not because I want to confuse her psychology because she's thinking, well, my daddy is a strong daddy. What's going on in here? But I want her to know that no matter how strong daddy is, there is a stronger God that even daddy goes to. You understand what I mean? And that is what being in the presence of God is all about. It's all about being vulnerable in his presence. It's all about being tender for the Lord. I want to give him access to all of me. I am yours and we sang that song. Everything that I am, every breath that I breathe. But it takes tenderizing yourself over time. You need to learn how to marinate yourself in his presence so that you can be fully seasoned, ready for the master's use. It doesn't just happen when we come in here. It happens before we get in here. Look at the online prayer meeting that we had. Some people for the first two, three hours, they couldn't pray because there were thoughts of the person owing them money, the person that they owe money to, that insurance course that they want to go and do the real estate you know, exam that they want to take. You have all of these thoughts in your mind. And then it takes you away. You have a longer runway. Come on. But guess what? If you have prayed before you left home, you, have had, you would have given yourself enough time to shed every one of those weights. And so that when you come before the presence of God, you're ready to stand. Do you know that when we write things down, we write things down sitting down? And writing things down is a process of emptying your mind and committing things down. And that's why sometimes, even though you're standing, let me say this, some people are physically standing in the presence of God, but in reality, in their minds, they're sitting down. Because they're still at their own desk. They have not come to the table of the Lord. But if you learn the process of first of, of soaking yourself in God's presence before you leave the house, when you come to that online prayer meeting, from the first 10 minutes, you're already laughing because you can hear the sound of angels. <laughs> oh yeah, and by the time you get to the second hour of the night, you're running across the room simply because your immediate environment is not, is not quick enough to catch up with what's going on in the realm of the Spirit. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit came upon Elijah, he ran for how many miles? Is it like 200 miles faster than chariots of horses? Oh, come on. Horses are fast. And this was a man. He just hit the ground and he was running. And when he got to where he was going, immediately he spoke. That tells you that to them he was running, but to him he was strolling. Nobody runs for 200 miles and get to where they're going and immediately, even if you're from Kenya and your, your, your both parents are from Kenya, you cannot do it. Oh yeah, because you know, we've seen Kenyans at the Olympics. They will run all those races. Even though they win, they still get to the end and collapse, even if it's for like five minutes before they go to the camera. The first interview is all smiles. <laughs> that's all because nobody can speak after you've run for that but Elijah immediately he got there the Bible says he spoke so even though they thought he was running faster than a horse the dude was probably strolling with the Holy Spirit because that is how they roll that is the speed at which they operate you can ask Barbara about speed she just bought a new Volvo and now she's praying every day not to get a ticket because she's been driving fast because speed allows for you to receive things, including tickets. You just have to choose not to take them. You see what I mean? But the morale of the story is this, guys. I'm encouraging you. See, there were, there were things on my heart leading to this meeting, but then I knew that they hinged on us being able to be translated from dimension to dimension. And that worship was kind of like a set up by the Holy Spirit because I don't typically look around during worship. But today, I, I, for some reason, I looked around and I'm like, I don't think people are into this thing as I am. And, I, and we all should be. Because, I mean, let me tell you something. I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. And I'm going to say it again with the verse of scripture. God is love. If you're not experiencing his love, you're not experiencing him. You can be experiencing angels. You can, be, you can be stumbling on boxes of blessings that are around somewhere in his presence, but don't settle for those things. Wait until you have experienced him. The woman with the issue of blood, 
could have just said, well, if I've come this close, maybe I can go check myself. Maybe I'm fine. She was like, no, me, today, I must touch the hem of his garment. The hem of Jesus' garment needs to be tangible to you. And for that to happen, it means you have to be in his dimension. And what is his dimension? In the realm of the spirit. And what is his material? Love. And which of those two things are you not capable of? Your spirit, made in the image and in the likeness of God. And you have the ability to love because God has already sent his love your way to activate you. Peter says, we love him because he first loved us. Our ability to, so everything that we need to be in that dimension is already given to us. We just need to mix it together and stir it and then drink it. And then off we go. I said, I'm going to show you a scripture. Come with me very quickly. In fact, this same Nehemiah that we have just read. Let's go to um, Nehemiah chapter 7. And hold on one second. Actually, let me show you something in, in, um, in Psalms chapter 2 verse 7 instead. I think that will communicate it. Um, so, Psalms chapter 2 verse 7. Yes, this is it. He says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Now, look at the word begotten. He said, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your pos possession. He says, today I have begotten you and then I will give to you whatever you ask. Jesus was begotten. The Bible says he is the only begotten son of God. What is the number one attribute of what you beget? Whatever comes out of you is like you. Right? God says as long as the earth remains, every time that we have a tree, it will have fruit that will carry a seed and that seed is exactly like that tree that produced it. Kind begets kind. And so when God is talking about begetting you today, he is talking about you being in that same dimension as he is. Your physical body cannot beget only spirit. Just imagine having a woman pregnant for nine months and at the end of nine months, just wind comes out of her. No, that body needs to beget another body. And so God is saying, for you to start asking for stuff, <laughs> wait until I have begotten you. If you are not begotten of me, if you are not like me, if you are not, if you don't have hands like I have hands, if you don't have my form, if you don't have my tangibility, forget about asking for stuff. But most of us, we want to exist in the dimension that is alien to God and yet we want to ask for things. You see what I'm saying? You want to ask for things. Seek him first. Find him. Engage him. Be begotten by him in that day and in that moment. In fact, in some cases, you no longer even need to ask. Because a lot of what we want to ask for is already in our nature if we would allow ourselves to manifest that nature. Lastly, let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Actually, Matthew chapter 19. I've been wanting to show us this for a minute. And I think it goes very well with what we're saying. Nine, Matthew chapter 19, we're going to read verse 4. And um, look at what he says. This was Jesus speaking about marriage and divorce. He said, and he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He says, you have to make contact before you become one. And until you are one, you cannot be fruitful and you cannot multiply. If I am going to be fruitful in my relationship with God, I have to be one with him. But I have to leave where I'm at to go to where he is. He's inviting me to come up yonder. If the Lord comes to my space, there is a limitation that is placed on the Lord because of my environment. My environment is not God's natural environment. Can I prove that to you? 
There were places that Jesus went to and he could not do much work because the environment was not, it was alien to God. They were operating in an environment of unbelief. And they were very complacent. They said, leave us as we are. They just wanted to be. They said, go, go find somebody else to bother. He went to a place, he cast out demons from a man and the demons went into their swine and the swine perished in the water and they were like, are you helping us? No, just leave us. Before you came, we had swine. Now we don't. So God was limited in that environment simply because it's alien to him. And that is the reason why it is important for us to learn how to come out of our human environment with all the limitations and go to where he is where there are no limitations. And that was why he says, once you have been once you have gotten begotten in my world, if I have given birth to you in my world and you're breathing the air in my space, then we can do all things. God knows that we can be lazy. God knows that we can be complacent. And that is the reason why he even puts an incentive to seeking him. He says, seek me and you will find me. He puts an incentive. He says, those who seek me, I will reward them abundantly. So when I, when I remind you or when the Lord is saying to you through my obedience today that you need to study the word of God as though your life depends on it. In reality, nobody studies the word of God with the right kind of hunger and thirst and lack of wisdom. And the moment you have wisdom, what can be hidden from you? When the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. The moment you have wisdom, there's nothing that you cannot manufacture. Wisdom is like having a 3D printer. You can print whatever you want because that is the building block of all things. So lastly, before we break bread, I'm going to just read to you a scripture from 2 Peter. And then I want you to see another dimension of what it means to be one with him. So 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's start reading from verse 2. The Bible says, let me even read from verse 1. Verse 1 is what I'm doing right now. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both which I stir up, where is my finger? Oh, oops, alrighty. Yeah, please, give it to me. Thank you. Thank you. He says, let me move away from that thing. It says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder. So I'm reminding you of the essence of these things. Verse 2 says that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Verse 4 is really where I'm going, but I want you to keep coming with me. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own laws, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are, from as they were from the beginning of creation. What was the problem of these people? Things are just okay the way they are. I mean, and they tell, there really isn't anything changing. It's been like this since the beginning of creation. And you know why they say that? Verse 3 says, because they, they want to continue in their own loss. What is the opposite of lost? We lost for things that pleasure our bodies. When we should hunger and thirst for the things of God. Anybody who wants the things of God must first of all recognize that these things in my space, they will always be like this. The physical realm will always be like this. And I am ready to accept it. But guess what? I don't have to remain in it all the time. I need to learn how to go up higher. Because if you remain in the physical, if you remain a, I mean, a stranger to the presence of God and to the realm of the spirit. You are forever limited. All you can enjoy in life are mementos and remnants for those who travel to the realm of the spirit. That's all you ever get to enjoy. You read people's books and okay, that's what God said to them. But what is he saying to you? So you need something fresh. And how do you get that? You have to rise up and change your posture. Even in the place where you're situated, your situation does not have to change before you rise. It is because you rise that your situation gets to change. 
Let's continue with John's analogy. When he was sitting there, his position was that of a sitting posture. Do you think he could have easily changed his location where he's situated? If he wants to change it, what does he do, Barbara? He gets up first and then he walks. That is exactly what the Lord is asking us to do today. To make an effort. To make our prayer lives and our relationship with him one that is dynamic. Feel your ability to speak to God and to hear from him by your hunger and thirst for every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When you worship God in your closet, you could start by playing YouTube videos and listening to music, but don't just listen, sing. Because if you do that well enough, you get to a time wherein even if there is no music, you will sing because by then you will start hearing the music that is being played in heaven. When such a dimension exists, why do you want to settle for just saying, okay, I'm in God's presence today. Yeah, the music was all right. I enjoyed it. But did you feel his love? Did you encounter him? Did you shake hands with him? Did you kiss the sun? Did you allow yourself to be born in his world? The choice is yours. Every single one of us should seek to appear in the realm of the spirit very regularly. Now let me, we're going to break bread. In fact, but let me show, let me, let's break bread with another scripture. Come with me to Exodus. And now we can rise so that when I see people standing, I think I'm a bit more mindful of time. So let's come to Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. Do you know that David said, come stand in the presence of God? Because there's a, there's a level of expectation that is demonstrated when you are in a standing position. Now, Exodus chapter 17 I want us to read Exodus chapter 17, verse 6. What does it say? Exodus 17, 17 verse 6. He says, Behold, I will stand before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. You know what God is saying here? God is saying, I'm going to show you guys how to make things happen. God could have sat and be just saying, okay, you go do that. Let's see what happens. He says, no, he says, I will stand before you. Let me tell you something, folks. A lot of us, we are surrounded by rocks and we feel like our lives are difficult. But do you know that those rocks carry water? They carry what nourishes you. But will you stand? Folks, standing is the key to accessing another dimension. Take a stand in his presence today. That going forward, you will show up. You will always appear in his presence. Let everyone be the ones to say, Stephen, you're always here. Do you not have stuff to do on earth? Yeah? Get to that point where it's like, okay, okay, maybe I'm doing this thing too much. Which, of course, before you get to that level, <laughs> Jesus would have come. Because I don't think any one of us can show up too much in his presence. Now, let me, we're going to read one more thing. And then, just so that you can get a good understanding of this verse 6 that I just read. Look at what the Bible said in verse 4, in verse 3. He says, and the people thirsted there for water. The people complained against Moses and said, why is is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with, with thirst, okay? Whereas, like I told you, what's going on here is not real thirst. This is lost. They're lusting for water. You see what I mean? Their real thirst should be for God. If your thirst is for things, you will always be frustrated. You would always feel like you, you lack something. Whereas the word of God to them was that they would lack nothing good. But here they are, they felt like they were lacking something. Whereas they weren't really lacking and they were just lusting for it. You see, because God is faithful, he will give to us everything that we need. All right? So you're seeing that however you swing it, the power to having a prosperous journey in this life as a believer is to always make sure that your thirst is for the things of God. Verse 4 says, So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall we do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. 
And verse 5 is what we're going to pray with. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. So, and then the Lord promised that it was going to stand before him. And the miracle will happen. The miracle that you need is going to happen using the rod that has worked for you before. We got saved by faith. We got saved by going to God. We went to him. He says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. We were the ones who said, Lord, oh, I am a sinner. I have been living without recognizing and acknowledging your love and your compassion. That was how you got saved. And Paul said to the Galatians, he said, oh, foolish Galatians, this was the way you got saved. Why are you not trying to be made perfect in another way? If you got saved, if you were born into God's kingdom by making contact with him, then guess what? Continue to make that contact with him because it is the same rod. You see what I'm saying? God could have said to him, point. Did God ever say to Moses, point? No, he always said to him, make contact, strike, touch the pool, do this, do that. With that rod that is in his hands, to let you know that you need to make contact with the Spirit if you will have what you need. As I want you to say today as you're standing here, saying, Father, by faith I was saved. Because it gave me access to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You called. I answered. You sent for me. And I came to you. Let me keep coming to you. Let me never lose the hunger. Nor the thirst for your presence. Renew my love for you. Father, you are life, you are love, and you are Lord over everything. Let me live my life every day as though it depends on you because it does. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because in your presence today we have made a pronouncement of faith. Father, the hunger and the thirst for the righteousness of your kingdom is not in our hands. We're asking you to gift it to us so that we can long for you and run after you as the deer pants for water. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let this be the beginning of a renewed walk with you for each and every one of us. Lord, let us seek to stand, to access. Let us desire from now on to always stand that we may gain access to the realm of the spirit let nothing else satisfy while men are thirsting for water let us thirst for you we receive this bread as the body of the Lord Jesus and this wine as his blood and as Jesus says this is my body this is my blood eat and drink in remembrance of me we do so today in remembrance of you let every essence within us be brought to remembrance of your love and let the principalities and powers even the forces that govern life also be brought to remembrance that it was for us that you died so that the gates can be lifted up and the everlasting doors the same as the king of glory comes in to receive us into his embrace you may eat and you may drink Jesus. Alrighty. Praise God. As you can see, this is what happens when we all come early. We get to start early, we got to finish early. Can you remember the last time you left here before 9.30? Yeah, but you're going to leave here before 9.30 today, God willing. Let's be seated. I've got two announcements uh, that I want to make very quickly. Uh, but not until I have prayed for two people very quickly because I know that there is... Um, so, Kenyatta, I just want to say to you that you need to come forward and receive your envelope. 
okay there's no envelope for you here in the natural but in the realm of the spirit you need to come forward to receive your envelope is a two-sided content that is in that envelope the Lord shows it to me I see it one side of it is a commendation for that which you have just resisted you know there were things that you resisted in this last season that even you could not believe that you were able to resist people who came who could have gotten what is that thing that we normally say I'm gonna give you a little piece of my mind but the Lord is commending you today because he saw how you held yourself back and how you put your body under and so the Lord is on one side giving you a commendation and it's a perfect commendation there are seven things written there as things of commendation to you but the other side of it has one instruction and it is not written it is drawn it is an arrow and it means to move in the direction so as you receive today this word of God it allows your feet to be light in obedience before the Lord so that when he says go you go your sensitivity is being heightened in this season so that you do not miss the window of delivery you see He's commended you to let you know that he has seen where you're coming from. He celebrates, heaven celebrates your accomplishments by being a spirit person, okay? You, you know what I'm saying because you know there are times where we want to be in the flesh a little bit and just hurt someone's feeling because they hurt our feelings. Now, you have to continue in that good work. When God takes us from one level to the other, we're not to take all the details with us, forgetting the things that are behind. But we're supposed to take the equipment with us because you would need that to be able to follow that arrow in every direction. Now, there is that gentleman who is sitting next to you, Masia. What's his name? Say that one time. Frazier. Victor. Okay. Victor, I'm going to pray for you today that supernaturally the Lord will delete from your mind things that have been said about you that are not true that hurt you they're not true whatever they said is not true but it seems like it's true because other people believed it and they seem to have said yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We, we see that too no they don't see that it is nothing but a lie you see you are only who your heavenly father say that you are already and I'm saying this not so that you can start to remember all of what they said to try to undo it on your own. The Lord is giving you, is gracing you today with that deletion. Your confidence needs to be where your heavenly father sets it to be. Because in order for you to be seen, you have to stand with the right posture. You see, the Lord wants his face to be seen on you and he wants your countenance to shine. But that light is not to be beamed at the floor. That light is meant to be beamed ahead of you because others have to see that light and your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So you wake up to a new man, to a new victor with confidence that only God gives. So before you go to bed tonight, thank God, say, Father, when no one saw me as I was hurting, you did. When no one saw me as they came at me with their tirades, you did. And by your love, you have rescued me. Now let us go and go to bed. You'll be amazed at how you will feel in the morning. You see, because the Bible says the Lord gives to his beloved in sleep. So be ready to receive of the Lord today. The angels of the Lord will minister to you. Communion house, I declare over you today, the Lord is giving us an emblem. I saw this in the realm of the spirit. I thought we were getting ready to make new t-shirts. And the angels of the Lord said to me, they said, no, you're not making this one. So we are. The Lord is making an emblem for us to carry as a house. It is a Gideon's kind of emblem wherein it is not going to be by our own ability or by our numbers but it's just going to be by the unction of the Lord that is upon every single person who has come to be a part of this work alrighty God bless you guys and um, Alan see your gift is already intimidating the kingdom of darkness okay so the enemy is trying to sort of like well when I see the enemy I want you to think about it the way that I always talk to you that there is nothing anyone does unless the Lord approves of it okay so when it looks like it's the opposition it is part of your training program okay so there will be a series of tests they might have even begun already in dreams things that may want your heart to fear things that may seem or appear scary you're supposed to laugh at the storm you're supposed to not regard them enough for you to regard fear in your heart okay it's a brief test but it's a very, very important test. So I declare over you today 
extra vigilance in the spirit extra vigilance in the subconscious so that things that you will not accept based on the word of God you will not accept in those dreams you will function and act as a good soldier of the cross even in every single dream that comes in the mighty name of Jesus God is good alrighty and I'm gonna say this I don't like to say things like this very much because I think that by now most of us should have gone past this level but as I was praying for Alan and just shortly before I heard do not worry about your finances okay you see that's why I don't want to say this because it's like man I don't think anybody here most of the people here I've seen you I've seen your faces you've been a part of the teachings here you're supposed to be trans worry okay but I keep hearing it do not worry about your finances so if that is you in fact so that we don't pick anybody out let's get up all together and do this exercise very simply and then we're gonna close out this meeting I want you to imagine that you're holding a piece of paper in your hand and it contains a list of the things that you worry about financially throw it down step on it and walk away and as you do that in the mighty name of Jesus as you have done that in physical obedience you will receive in the realm of the spirit triumph over that spirit of worry about finances that has plagued you in this season god bless you communion house thank you for coming out tonight god bless you in jesus name amen praise god now what we're gonna do very quickly i almost forgot is the announcements will roll on the screen it's going to begin with the giving slide so that if you need to be reminded i don't think anybody needs to be reminded about what those are but you're going to see that on the screen and then on saturday right on saturday um we, i want a group of us to go out in the area so i want i want to encourage you to see if you can come here for 3 p.m the details of it is going to be in the whatsapp group for 3 p.m on saturday i want us to have about um an hour to 90 minutes of engaging people and since it's between meals by the time we get here at about 5 30 we're going to have something light to, to feast on it might just be pizza and some drinks but we're going to have something but we, the word of god is we need to go to the highways and the byways all right you know we're not in the basement anymore now we're not just in the corner of the basement right we're out now even though we have people who wish they could join us who have been watching online who have been following very closely um I will encourage you to, if you're watching this, which is going to be next week, Tuesday, why don't you do the same in the environment where you're in? The details will be communicated, but prepare your heart to come out, to go to the highways and byways, to minister to people and to invite them to come. God just says, you bring them, I'll feed them, all right? So we don't have to try to transform them. We just need to bring them, all right? So go to the highways and byways and bring them. So that's it. But please, if you, for some reason, cannot make that, still be punctual we're going to be starting that service six o'clock god willing all right god bless you guys and we will see you on saturday